Okay, let's see what else is in here. Ooh, wow, look at that. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. The Adventures of Marco Polo. Hello everybody, this is George the Antique Nomad and I'm in beautiful Florence, Italy. Oh, wait, Florence, Kentucky. And we're at the Florence Antique Mall. Kitchen collectibles never seem to go out of style, and this group here is a 1950s pattern, mid-50s, from the Hull Pottery Company in Ohio, and that's Hull, H-U-L-L, -L, not Hall, H-A-L-L. Of course, that one, you can't really see the mark, but let's see if this one has it. This is the Sun Glow pattern. Sometimes it just says USA, so you need to know the pattern on this one, but this is Hull Pottery, this is when they found out they could only make the gloss glazes after their factory exploded and burned and they rebuilt and the new stuff could only do the high gloss. So they did a line of kitchenware in this. And it was very popular in the mid 50s and still popular with kitchen collectors. Price on the three mixing bowls is around with the discount. They're doing a little sale. So 55 to $60 for the set of three, which is less than 20 a piece. So that's pretty good. And the pitcher here, after the discount is around 30. So another thing for you kitchen aficionados, if you like the happy, mellow sort of pastel tones, this is a good way to go about doing your kitchen. So there's a couple of different ways to put together showcases. If you are into a theme, you can put it together with a light selection where you can see everything really clearly and they have some really neat stuff. The gem player here for $600 is about what they go for. These were little portable cylinder disc players back from about 1900. And so this one's basically got a sample of various things, all mainly related to records and sound. Or you can do like this dealer, where you understand that you're paying rent, so you want to get everything you possibly can in there. The only problem is how do you get any of it out without breaking it and how can someone actually see something to isolate to buy? So you've got to find a happy medium. If you're going to pile it high and deep, remember that people are going to have to pick through it all and that may be dangerous for your merchandise. So you may want to think about that. I see some cool stuff in here, but I'm almost afraid to even ask because I'm not sure how you would uh, get to it. <laughs> Old telephones are pretty collectible now, and this case shows some of the evolution of them. The candlestick phones were really popular in the 1920s. They were the first ones fitted with a direct dial where you could call directly in town or call the operator directly. You didn't have to crank the phone and get the operator to make a call. So that was a big advancement in the 1920s. This one's unusual because it has the hook for the shoulder as well. And then, we also start to see wall phones in the 1930s. This is one of the very first, just a very small unit with the dial and then the receiver hung on it like that. This Western Electric was probably the most popular telephone in the 1920s and 30s. Came out right about the time the Depression started and ran through pretty much almost to World War II. And you saw those on desks everywhere. That was the classic phone that most people had. And that was because the Bell system ordered it to go with their lines. And the phone companies owned them back then. And when something would become obsolete, they would dump them in a river or in the ocean or somewhere where people couldn't get hold of them because they were for rent. And they didn't want you to get your own phone or you wouldn't rent the phone from them. So a lot of these got trashed right away. In the 1940s, this is the classic phone from the 40s. You see the beveling on it. That's a Bakelite body, and that's the automatic electric Type 40 monophone. And it is very, very heavy. The audio quality was really good on those. This one to the right, this one's actually an Army uh, Signal Corps phone, but they called them the toaster phone because of the shape. And you could get these for private use as well. 
And then those were replaced in the 50, late 40s, early 50s by these, the Western Electric 302. That's a classic. You see they have several of those. You'd see these on the set of the I Love Lucy show in the early years. And they were replaced by, in the late 50s and into the 60s, by the 5302. And that's the one that a lot of folks nowadays who are alive and remember old rotary phones, that was the last one they remember. You see some old wall phones of various types down here on the bottom too. This guy's obviously restored and repaired all of them. And they're pricing anywhere from uh, 100 and a quarter to two and a quarter. Those are about the right prices now. There is a lot of interest in old telephones. People are using them not just as props, but some people are going back to landlines because it's part of a package. And so they just as soon have a cool old phone as a new one. We were thrifters and secondhand shoppers before I was even born in my family. And so I grew up with this toy chest because my sisters had it before me and even they got it used. I think originally these were made in the late 50s or early 60s, but they're good sturdy wooden. They lingered for a long time. Now that there's interest in not just children's wear, but anything with old Western motifs, these have actually gone up in value quite a bit. You see it's got all the brands on the side here and they have it marked at 145. I haven't seen one go as high as that, but I've seen them go over 100 before on a few occasions. So I do think there's customers for these now. And you'll occasionally find them in old estates. A lot of people do keep their kids stuff and they'll just sort of shut the door to the room and there it's all setting years later. So these are something to look for out there. Once in a while you luck out and get things that are a generation older than you would expect. Now just know when you're out there shopping, I see a sign that says antiques. I don't see a single antique on this entire wall. In fact, I don't even see anything that's old enough to be vintage to sell on Etsy, and they're really only cutting back to 20 years old. So it does pay to really learn your stuff because just because it says it's in an antique mall doesn't mean it's old. These are not in fantastic shape, but at the end of Prohibition, the original cans that came out for beer were cone tops. So anytime you see one with this raised top, you know that this is older than about the 1950s, because in the 50s, they switch over to the cans like we are used to seeing now, although these are all steel. Now we have aluminum, of course. So cone tops, just because of the shape, are automatically worth about $20 and up if they're in any sort of good condition. Some of these are pretty rough, but there's a few that are clean enough that they would uh, definitely sell. The Berghoff City Club over here. People like a lot of the old brands that are not around anymore, and they must have found a big barn find because they have just a whole lot of various old beer cans. And yes, there are collectors. Price on this one, for example, $18.95. Dawson's Pale Ale, not from Dawson City or Dawson Springs, just some guy named Dawson. Here's a couple of fun things that are a little more modernist that people are interested in now. These big trays, designer signatures started to be a thing in housewares in the 50s with the advent of designers like Sasha Brostoff. It was partly a way to distinguish American makers from the flood of imports coming from Japan and Europe. This one is Georges Briard. That was not his real name, but he and his partner did a lot of these very modern designs. He really essentially invented the chip and dip set. And so you see all of these trays for informal living at the time. And they're fun designs. This one is rather large and it's got all the fruit designs on it. A lot of times they're clear with gold. This one's got a little more color. So it's priced at $40 and I've seen them sell in about that range. And he also did interesting things like tables and ice buckets, little pieces of occasional furniture. So there's a lot of Georges Briard out there. And then this is a Francoma piece. And if you think, boy, that sure doesn't look like any Francoma I've ever seen. It's because this was part of a designer series that they did as limited editions from 1969 until their second fire in 1983, which destroyed that part of the factory. They all were signed. This one is Johnice Frank. That was John Frank, the owner's daughter who ran the company until it ended. 
This is V8. V1 was 1969. It was the first limited edition. They made between 3,500 and 7,500 of these specialty vases and decanters each year. And this one was 1976. You can tell because of the flame glaze and the stars around the bottom. So this was their bicentennial effort. These are different pieces of treasure craft from various eras, and I'll show you these first because these have a good mark on the back. These are from their very first factory in Southgate, California, and they are actually marked very well on the back, Treasure Craft, Southgate, California. A lot of companies did various versions of these after Treasure Craft came out with them around 1950. These are priced at $24 each, which is not a bad price for the banana wall pocket. You see strawberries and some other fruit as well that they did. But after that, they switched over to the rubbed bisque where it was a teak colored glaze. And then they do these crazy spattered glazes in the middle. This one was called lava because of the orange and yellow and this one is for SeaWorld. SeaWorld's under a lot of pressure now but when I was a kid it was considered a great place to go and take your kids. Now people have a little different view of keeping these sorts of animals in captivity. SeaWorld would make these and Treasure Craft could mark it on the back so that you knew where it came from unless it was made for Disney in which case it had to say Walt Disney Productions. Disney did not want anybody but Disney to get credit for the stuff that they sold. And so those treasure craft pieces do not say that they're treasure craft. Also in this space, we have a very cute 1970s frock and this lovely little parasol, which actually is a Georges Briard serving tray. But it sure looked like an upside down umbrella, which was the point. And you see it matches that other piece. He would do a lot of different items in the same line so that you could do a lot of mix and match accessories for tables. And this one's priced at 45. It's a harder one to find, so that's probably about top end for this, but I've seen them priced that way before. Okay, let's see what else is in here. Ooh, wow, look at that. The Adventures of Marco Polo with Gary Cooper. That is a very large sign. That had to be in a big theater, and it's really not even a full sheet. It's a different shape than they usually made. They generally were done vertically like posters. So I'm not sure exactly how you would describe this other than it's original and it's $300, and there's probably only a few left in existence. So while I'm thinking of it, please comment in the space below here, and also hit the thumbs up button to like this video. If you haven't subscribed, click the subscribe button below. Also, hit the bell below to be notified of new videos coming every Monday and Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And thank you so much for following along. Let's go back to this video. I wanted to show these architectural pieces. These are Victorian and they're very heavy, so I'll put the little Florida glass I found down. But these would tell stories. You have the uh, books, you've got the hammer and tongs. Uh, someone referred to these as being Masonic, but I don't see anything that indicates an actual Masonic imagery other than the hammer and tongs. They're priced at $2.25 a piece. It's uh, called a Solomon's Arch, but there's also this one with the uh, swag. And we just don't see very many Victorian metal pieces that are not on buildings anymore. Most of them were ripped off decades ago and thrown away or melted for steel. A lot of them ended up being uh, sent to Japan, actually, before the Second World War and then fired back at us during the Second World War, unfortunately. So a lot of that stuff's gone now. And then this little bit here I should just show. This is a nice little Florida screen print glass from before Disney, so you see the bathing beauties and all the natural attractions that were the big thing that brought people to Florida back before the big theme parks. Although they had some little stuff like you notice down here, and this was probably one of the sponsors, Cypress Gardens, the Singing Tower, the Parrot Jungle. So there were a few little attractions, but this heralds from 1950s Florida, and it's priced at $5 minus discount. There's some room in that because I sell in Florida. 
For those of you who like day glow and uranium glass, well, these bumper stickers from the 60s were done in day glow that is fluorescent. You'll see a lot of phosphorescent signs in the 40s and 50s as well. Some people are afraid of it because they figure the chemicals they used to make that stuff were bad, but it's inert in its current state. And then above it, I see this. It says spangled glass vase. Unfortunately, it's got a few too many chips, but this is Czechoslovakian glass. It's just impossible to see the mark on it now. In fact, this may not have had a mark. This is priced at 10. If it were in good shape, that's a $30 piece. Teach Out. I'm not sure who Teach Out was, but it's advertising and it's a letter opener. Cleveland and Columbus. I know people who are ah, sashes, doors, glass frames, and finish, so not for teachers. I know people who used to teach in Cleveland, but I guess that's not for them. This was a company called Vintoy that made tin items, and a lot of them were child-oriented, but this one was to sell Supreme Biscuits, and it's the Great Supreme Biscuit Animal Show tin. This is going to be from the 1930s. Vintoy did a lot of things for kids like banks and things, but this one has a huge circus parade scene all the way around the edge. The idea was that this would get little kids to sit at the table and eat their food if they had something entertaining to look at or a story that could be told to them while they were having bites of food shoved in their mouth in between stories. This is priced about $40. It's a little rough for condition, but it's a hard one to find. And of course, nowadays people think differently about circuses. The days of the traveling circus are pretty much over, but it was a big deal back then. And they were popular in the time. And there are circus collectors now who think they're pretty interesting too. These were made by the Expert Toy Company in Ohio. And we don't see a lot of them left. They are done in the 1940s and 50s. So these were for the first wave of baby boomers to ride. And they're made of mohair or other fuzzy stuff that isn't as scratchy as mohair. And they're cute. The wheels turn on this one pretty well. These are priced at 95 each. This one, the steering column doesn't work so well. Mohair is a very stiff, bristly feel. And as time went on, you see a lot of things that are made of it in terms of upholstery and even children's toys. This, think about stife animals, they have a mohair. It was a little uncomfortable for kids because kids have sensitive skin. So then they switched to these sorts of synthetics that were a little easier on the skin. <laughs> now a lot of people might look at this panther and assume Hager automatically, but this sort of speckled glaze that seems to be blurred is indicative of a company called Gonder. And this has the Gonder mark upside down. We'll turn it over so you can see. Gonder Original. Lawton Gonder worked for Shawnee Pottery at first, and he was one of their first employees and designers back in the 30s and 40s. And then he branched out on his own in the 50s, and he did 50s modern styles. There are a few Gonder pieces that are pretty desirable now, especially the patterns that have fish, and this particular panther, he's priced at 75, and that's about the going rate on these because they're big and they have a really cool glaze pattern, so people enjoy them. Uh, I hate that furniture. I mean, it'd be fine if there was more to it, but that one piece by itself is just kind of hard to illustrate to me. And then this piece is Hull. We've seen a few pieces of Hull this trip. Uh, again, H-U-L-L, -L, as you see on the bottom. And if you turn it around, you'll see the parchment and pine cone. I have a pair of candlestick holders that I just got that match this. And that would have been the set would be the candlesticks on either side and a bowl like this in the middle, or in this case, a basket. This was made in the mid-50s along with Ebtide. They were Hull's big designer decorator products from the mid-50s. And they had the shiny gloss glaze that they could do in their second factory. It's a little compromised for condition. They have $50, but they say that there's a uh, rough spot on the underneath. And I have to say that to me, it looks like it's just a manufacturing flaw. That wouldn't deter me from buying it at all. So for $50, I think it's actually pretty well priced.
We see a lot of Blanco glass in this part of the country, and it's very popular with modernist collectors, but a lot of the people are not aware that they did a line of paperweights around 1970. This one has the foil handshake label on it, so it's easy to determine that this one's Blanco, but take a look at the patterning. They had a very controlled, elongated bubble around, and so this is one that you will see without a label. Knowing this is Blanco can give you a good leg up because this one's priced about $40, which is about the going rate on these. And you'll see these sometimes mistaken for new Chinese ones at estate sales and they'll only be a few bucks. So this is one to look into. And if you look at the old Blanco catalogs, you will find the entire line in the Leslie Pena book where you can compare and contrast and get a good idea of what you're looking for out there. Okay, our next stop apparently is the Bronx Station because this is an old strap hanger from the New York subway cars. The ones that you'd hang on to and it'd kind of go back and forth as the train rocked back and forth. And it's helpful that it said that on this nice little piece here. I think that they decommissioned a lot of these older subway cars in the 1960s and these were removed and probably sold as nostalgia items at that time. It's the first time I've actually run into one. They have it priced at $100, and that seems like for someone from New York as an oddity, that would be an interesting thing to have. Maybe use it as a towel bar or something. I just wanted to show something to our viewers down under. We do occasionally get things from Australia and New Zealand. In fact, I've got a really neat P&O cruise ship line uh, souvenir boomerang that I'll have to show you sometime. But in the meantime, this particular group of placemats is on a rough sort of textured linen, kind of like Irish linen, but maybe even a grass linen. It's hard to say because they're still new in the original package. I'm sure someone went on a trip to Australia in the 1970s and brought these back. And they are printed as designed in Australia by Heil, H-E-I-L. Now maybe some of you folks down there run into Heil designed items. I have actually seen this name on other pieces designed in Australia, but I don't know anything about Heil, so we'll have to do a little research. This place is big and I just needed to sit down and I picked these. These are from the late 60s, early 70s, and they swivel really nicely and they're only 99 for the pair. I have to say I'm kind of tempted to take them home. This one seems like it's a little stuck though, so there we go. Might need a little bit of lubrication, but the vinyl's in good shape and that's what really matters. Plus they have a back, and I personally find that a stool with a back is much more comfortable than one without, so these might be a winner. Well, I'm waiting in line to make my purchases at Florence Antique Mall. It's been a fun day. It's nice to be out getting around and seeing things again. So thanks for joining me. I am George the Antique Nomad on Periscope, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and here on YouTube. And in the meantime, I will see you from the next hunting ground as soon as we get there. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!